Okay, we're going to go ahead and just get started so everything is on schedule. Good evening and welcome to Inclusive Product Week, everyone. My name is Grace. I'm from Code from San Jose, and I'll be moderating today's session. We'll take questions again at the end of the presentation, so feel free to submit those either in the chat or in the Q&A tab. And it is my honor to introduce our speaker, Camila Chiriboga, who will be presenting on practicing inclusive fashion design. Camila is a designer whose passion lies at the intersection of fashion, health, and technology. She seeks to use design to be more inclusive of people with all kinds of abilities and ages by providing functional clothing that will improve our everyday lives. So please welcome to the stage, Camila. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll start sharing my screen. Let me know when you can see that. Okay. So hello, everybody. And today I'd like to talk to you about practicing inclusion and what it means for fashion. Because for me, in times of greatest need is when creativity has ignited innovation. At least this always happens to me. So has anyone used one of these tools with a rubber grip to allow for easier hold? How many times has it saved you from actually getting cut? So a tool so simple like this one can make a difference between being able to cook or having to rely on someone else for such a simple daily task. In my own work, I've realized that all through my practices, designing more inclusively really opens the doors for people to be able to do things more independently that they don't want to need to rely on someone for. For me, inclusive fashion design means listening, attend, listening and observing to be able to learn about another's lived experience and therefore design more inclusively and create new ways of dressing the human body. And so this all started with my heritage. This started with my great grandfather that would import textiles all the way from Europe and Asia into my little country in South America called Ecuador. This continued with my father and my grandfather who started a men's tailoring manufacturing factory. And then when I was 10 years old, I got my first sewing machine. And I really love sewing so much that Soon after, my dad got me an industrial sewing machine because there was no one from stopping me sewing all day. And this is one half of my heritage, but the other half is what really made my perspective on fashion changed. So my other side of my inheritance was a kidney disease that I inherited. And so during my first summer after joining Parsons in New York City, I had to have a surgery. So the surgery wasn't that complicated, but the recovery process was long and very painful. And every day I had to ask my dad to put on my clothes. And this got me thinking, how many more people my age, adult, young adults or even children, still need their parents to dress them every day? And that's what ignited in me the desire to learn how to design more inclusively for people who daily process of dressing is a very complicated, time-consuming, or even impossible task. And following in these steps, I have met lots of people who also are, to, uh, who also believe in inclusivity, and especially fashion, and most of all, collaborating with people from all different fields, including engineering, medicine, technology, and bringing all of our thoughts together to create products that can really change people's lives. So with this group of people, we've been changing everyday objects that shape our lives and that really affect people's day-to-day -day living. And through all the people I've met, I've been able to create beautiful projects. And today I'll share some of you, some of them with you. So one of the group of people who we thought about was older population, because when visiting a rehabilitation center with older adults, I realized how little we think for this, how, to, how little we think of designing for this stage of our lives. 
What if we would think a little longer term for our own future, that of our parents and our grandparents? Because when visiting the center, I realized that dressing was a daily, very complicated and stressful process for all of the people there. And now, because of the pandemic, since I got the chance to go back and visit my grandmother and be able to help her during her dressing process, I realized how complicated and energy draining this process was for her. So I asked myself, what if clothing could be designed in a simpler way for older adults to dress and as a result, improve upon their mental health? And even though this seemed a question maybe impossible to tackle through clothing, with the group of people we worked, we could see actual scientifically quantitative results that our clothes could have on people's health and well-being. So the person I got to work with is Michelle. So when I first met Michelle at Riverside Rehabilitation Center in New York City, I just melted with her smile, her gentle spirit, and her desire to look beautiful for her loving husband. Michelle was a wheelchair user who we met, and I and today I would love to share with you what we made, created for her. So Michelle told us a little bit about herself, about loving elephants and being a fan of all things pink and purple, as you can clearly see in the outfit she was wearing while sitting next to her husband. And while we, while we were talking to her, we realized a lot of wear and tear on her sleeves due to the constant rolling in motion. And we realized that this maybe not, it wasn't something that only affected her, but actually lots of other people that lived in the center as well. So we did want to address this through better design. And so we went through Michelle with her through her daily process, which involved um, care, the help of a caregiver and a mechanical lift. So for the top half of her body, she would be dressed in a lying position. She would, be, she would use the first uh, top layer, for example, a t-shirt with a colorful logo or a shirt. She would be put on in a lying position. And then for the bottom, either a skirt or pants, she'd be also dressed by her caregiver in a laying position. Once she had these on, she would be transferred with the mechanical lift onto her wheelchair where she was finally assisted with her jacket. And all of this was done by a caregiver, but she did want to be able to do some of these things by herself. And so with a team of, uh, with a physical therapist called Jessica Otolo, and engineer Sid Lamut, we got to work to create the garments that would suit her needs and her desires. So the first garment we created was a skirt. So because she loved using skirts and that made her feel beautiful and feminine, we created a skirt for her that had opening on the sides and would be much easier for her caregiver to assist her on wearing in a lying position. So what looked like a skirt did have pants on the inside because her caregiver would tell us that she often would get cold on her legs and that would make her, um, her anxiety levels rise. So we did want to keep her warm and for her to still look like she was wearing a skirt. Then for the top half of the body, we created a jacket. So she had mentioned that when she was sitting around the area, if there were no nurses or anyone to help her quickly, she, was, she would have to just sit down and really feel really cold and that wasn't good for her anxiety levels. So she did want to be able to put her jacket on independently so she could put on and take off whenever she wanted. But due to her range of motion, she couldn't reach towards the back. So it was pretty hard for her to be able to put on a jacket by herself. Therefore, we pursued a design that had a high back, a high back, that allowed her to be able to easily put on the jacket with motions only from the front. Then we created sleeves that were shaped for her seated position. And we created a collar that had some inserts underneath so she could easily pull off and put on independently. And our final iteration of the garment was called Love Simple. So this was an ensemble to address the lack of, in of inclusive and stylish clothing for the aging population. The best feeling is to see someone shine in what you have created. And Michelle felt beautiful in this skirt and jacket that addressed her needs 
and her tastes. And even though I wasn't in 100% in favor of the bold elephant print on the skirt, I did know that it made Michelle smile every time she looked down at it. So through design, what I realized is that not being able to dress as we age is not due to a disability, but a lack of design consideration. We have to think a little longer term to design for our own future selves to have a better quality of life. Because fashion typically puts youth at the forefront, designing only for this stage of life. But the aging population as well is affected by the way they look. It really affects them both for personal and practical reasons. So of course, we will want to maintain our aesthetic and we will want to look good even when we age. Another person I got the chance to design for was Sean Horn. Sean is an activist, speaker, and writer who, who is an advocate for people with disabilities. So Sean has often uh, invited to very important speaking events, and she always dressed beautifully because she, her mom was always involved in the beauty industry. So having her mom dressing very stylishly, Sean was always encouraged on what to wear to elevate her height and posture. And so because Sean was invited to these important events, she did want to look good in something like a coat. Because she said often when she'd go to these speaking events, she would want to, be, even though she didn't care to ask for help for someone to help her, for example, put on a coat, she did want to be able to do it herself. So with my team, we got to work. We followed Sean along her every day. We accompanied her to a coffee shop, to her home, and we were able to visit with her at least once or twice a week. And through working with her, we realized what, uh, what design she would want created for her. And we also addressed the needs her, for her uh, physically and aesthetically. So after many samples and iterations, we came up with a few solutions, but one of the most important factors was protecting her from the rain because in the busy streets of New York City, she often felt herself soaked in the rain because she couldn't quickly run for refuge. So she just had to wait until a cab would come by to pick her up because while using her two poles to walk, she was not able to hold on to an umbrella. And so in our design, we address this through using a wool coat um, fabric that was water resistant. And inside the collar of her jacket, we hid a hood that would cover her from the rain. She could easily pop out and she would be covered from the rain. Then when addressing her way of walking when, and looking at her other pieces of clothing, we realized that of her other coats would get a lot of wear and tear under the sleeves because of her motion that accompanied her arms while walking. And so we wanted to really make sure that we had an elastic and resistant material that we could use on her around her arms to allow her to be able to easily flow and synchronize her arms when she walked. So what we, what we chose was a four-way stretch material in a black fabric that you can see on the image in the, on the right. And this highly elastic material would allow her to easily move and avoid any wear and tear. And it complemented the gray wool coat fabric that we use for the rest of the body. So to be able to put on and take off the coat, we had Sean go over the motion of doing this over and over again. And what we realized was that she always did this in a seated position and that she would always get caught on the chair. And this was and this was important part of observation. This was something she hadn't noticed, but with us watching her, we noticed right away. And so the way we addressed this was through creating a long opening on the back, a high coat tail that would allow her to put the jacket on and not get caught on the chair. And this, she said, was something that she found really interesting that we noticed that she had never noticed before. And because this was a personal piece, the personal touch came from a purple, fully purple lined coat. And we printed on it a symbol of her organization called Give Beauty Wings. So Sean looked radiant in the coat we created for her. 
that suited her needs and her weather conditions. And as she said, more than a coat, this was a vessel of love. There is nothing, there is no price for that. So she says that with fashion, you can really change the way someone feels and the way they perceive others. And it's really important to bring confidence and to allow someone to really know that they look beautiful in the garment that is designed for them, but also if it's not personally designed for them, that is addresses their needs and they'll feel comfortable in it. And the most interesting facts for improvement always came through collaboration with Sean, who was able to tell us what she felt and what she needed. And so this experience was truly about focusing on one person's needs and desires, but it directly translated into being able to create unique pieces with functionalities that would serve anyone and would be literally used by millions of people. When being a designer for Uniqlo in Japan, I realized that these learnings really helped me because I had to focus on our customer specific needs, but create solutions that could be literally translated and used by millions of people around the world. And by truly listening to people's ideas, attentive observation and collaboration, the best ideas are found. So my most profound insights came when I started working with people who are blind and visually impaired. I realized how much the fashion industry had to change to be more inclusive. Because how do you create a visual identity when visuals are as intangible as feelings? I was completely captured by the idea of how people who are blind and visually impaired do not perceive others or do not judge them based on their appearances, but do wonder themselves what others' visual appearances or what others' perception of them will be due to their visual appearance. So I started working on what I called VO. VO is a more inclusive system of fashion for the blind and visually impaired, which encompasses a more holistic, um, more ho holistic sensorial experience for fashion. And this could have never happened without collaborating with lots of people who were assistant, who were um, professors of blind and visually impaired people or blind and visually impaired themselves. I worked with people all ages from babies to children, teenagers and adults, as well as with educators. And during my research, I realized different daily tasks and different challenges that clothing, uh, that clothing, um, that they had with clothing. And the most important insights came though, when I got to work with three guys that are here on the screen, Gus, Sammy and Adriel. So Gus is an assistive technology specialist who works with teaching children how to adapt to their vision loss. He educates them on how to use assistive technology for it to enter the workplace or for their schooling. Gus told me that he had that he had he loved fashion, even though he couldn't see, he didn't want people to think he didn't care about the way he dressed. He still loved to match his colorful uh, socks to his colorful t-shirts, but it did take him a long time to dr get dressed and it was a complicated process. He asked me to design for him a denim jacket and electrical blue pants that he had always dreamed of owning. Sammy was in his, Sammy was in his first year at NYU, which was a huge accomplishment for him. And this summer he wanted to have, that summer I worked with him, he wanted to enter a internship to get some working experience. But what he was worried about is not knowing how to dress appropriate for a business work setting. He would have to choose business attire and be able to look good in it, to be able to uniformly fit in with his coworkers. And what he had told me is he wanted some, and more than looking stylishly, what he wanted is for me to teach him how to use the appropriate items for his daily work. And finally, Adriel. Adriel was in his last years of high school and the most important to shape his personality and identity. And Adriel would tell me that he still, he was, he had a struggle that he still needed his mom to dress him every day. And when going shopping, either with a family member or friend, they had to pick out clothing for him and then try to describe it to him. 
but he really didn't know if he could trust what they were picking out for him, and he did want to look cool for school. So he asked me to create different items for him that would adapt to his personality and make his personality shine, but at the same time help him uniformly fit in with his group of friends. And for Adriel, it was really important that I created all of his clothes that would match his favorite sneakers as he was a big sneakerhead. So for each one of them, I created three different outfits. So for Sammy, I created three outfits that would be appropriate for the work setting. For Adriel, I created clothing he could wear outside with his friends like jackets and casual pants. And then for Gus, I created the denim jacket he wanted and a more elegant jacket for his work setting or presentations. And when going over all of the, when working with them and exploring their everyday life, meeting with them on a weekly basis and other people, I realized that the three fundamental challenges that made fashion challenging was identification, interaction, and safety. So identification means the knowing what your garment is and how to wear it. So how to create a visual identity. The second is interaction, which meant the physical action of putting on and taking off garments. And finally, safety. Safety meant having garments that would protect the wearer from their surroundings and at the same time work with their assistive technology they currently felt comfortable with. So to address each one of these, I created different solutions and today I'll present a few to you. So first off, for identification, the first solution was a language called VO. This was a tagging system that was, that was accessed through audio, visuals, and tactile cues. And what this does is it describes to the, gar to the wearer what the garment is, what it looks like, how to use it, and how to care for it. And these were the four most important elements Gus told me he needed to be able to know what he wanted to use on a daily basis. And Adriel reminded me, though, that the most important fact was to make this VO language something that anyone would be able to intuitively and quickly learn because he didn't want it to be another isolating language only for people who are blind and visually impaired. He wanted anyone to be able to learn it and share with him. So I tested this language out with people who were both sighted and not, kids, children, and older adults to make sure it was simple and easy to use. And I created fun ways to learn it as well. For example, with this t-shirt that has the VO color code language on the front in a tactile form that describes the, th the 2D printed tech, um, print on the back. The second solution was turning all 2D visuals into 3D textures. And this meant translating anything that was not, that was not tactile into something tactile. This was this what I how I arrived to these solutions was through a process visiting Adriel's teenager friends every Thursday at the center in New York City. So every Thursday when I'd meet with them, I'd take them different textile swatches I had come up with that week, different textures and different materials, and they would touch them and tell them tell me what they felt, what they think, what they thought that could be used for, and what they would want for their garments. So this was one of the most fun processes with all of them sharing. So then for, ident for, um, for interaction, the garments had to be as simple as possible to put on and take off. So I wanted to create iconic pieces anyone could identify and know how to wear. With Gus, we went we, with Gus, we came up with a solution of having different tactile cues around his garments for him to be able, easily be able to dress and undress. For example, putting velvets near openings and closures or pockets so he could easily find. And with Gus, we went through the process of dressing and undressing various times. So we would time each, we would time it and each time make sure it would be more efficient. This was really important for him because he did have to get to work quickly in the morning and he wanted to make sure that these clothes actually improved the time he would take on dressing. 
and as well make him look stylish. For interaction, the second solution was making everything reversible because Sammy would often tell me that he'd feel embarrassed by having his clothing the wrong way around. And I noticed this at lot at people I visited who are blind and visually impaired. So we thought, why would clothing have to have a right or wrong way of using it? We should actually have two ways you can wear it any way you want and have two color options at the same time. And third, safety. So for safety, we made sure all pockets were closed either with zippers, snaps, or with buttons. Because when Adriel was walking around in New York along the busy streets, if he would drop anything, he couldn't just look around and pick it up. It was practically gone. And so he did want to make sure that whenever he put something in his pockets, it was safe and protected. And this was something very important that came up with lots of the people I worked with. And finally, for safety, it was important to make everything I created easily accessible through um, through assistive technology that already exists in our users' current smartphones. So the tagging system's audio was easily accessible by any smartphone with a normal camera that could scan the audio. And Gus would often tell me that for him, this tagging system was really important because the same way the wheelchair provided access into physical spaces, the tag would provide the access for people to be able to more easily and independently be able to choose and dress their with clothes on a daily basis. And so this was one of the most important factors. And he did want his students that he'd be teaching on how to dress and their basic skills for living and work. He wanted to be able to teach them about this tagging system and for them to be able to easily feel comfortable using it with assistive technology they already knew about. And these are some of the solutions that you can now see that are what came after um, all the iterations and design and research process behind. But for all this process, I had to totally rethink how fashion is created. For example, even making uh, sketches textural for my users to be able to explore. And I had to completely expand my descriptive vocabulary of materials, colors, and what fashion meant. And at the end, I realized that my users, they felt radiant in what they were wearing. And more than anything, knowing what they were wearing and how to wear it gave them the confidence that they could do anything by themselves. And they, it gave them the confidence to embrace new challenges and live more independently. Because we totally underestimate the process of dressing until it becomes a challenge. And it, if it, it isn't already a challenge for you, it will definitely be one when you age at some stage in your life. So this is why I, I believe in a future where fashion will be inclusively designed for people's emotional, mental, and physical well-being. So next time you design, I would like to ask you to think of how you could be more inclusive working with and for people. Thank you. And now I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camila. That was so insightful. And um, as chat has said, this is so cool and incredible um, just to get that perspective. So thank you so much. And I hope everyone who's uh, in this session has learned something new. And um, like we said, we're gonna open it up for maybe one or two questions as we don't wanna go too much over time. Um, leave them in the chat or in the Q&A section of the session's um, pop out. Um, I guess I have a question just to get things started off with yeah. is um, you had so many different perspectives and new um, design ideas to incorporate for accessibility. And mm -hmm. um, I guess in terms of mainstream fashion right now, um, of all the things that you mentioned, does not seem very accessible to people who are either aging or have a disability. Um, what are some things that they can include? For instance, your tagging system seems absolutely amazing, something that could be easily incorporated um, that would make fashion 
right now, currently, as it is um, a step closer to your um, goal and vision? Yeah, and so I think that inclusive, like if people, for example, people who need their clothing to be adapted to their needs, somewhere where I would point them to is Open Style Lab, the organization with which I've worked and learned so much from. So they have some things that are called hack kits on their website, and they teach you how to customize the clothing you need for it to be more inclusive if you are the person that needs any adapt, um, adaptions on your clothing. But also I think in based on the fashion system, I think and the fashion industry, I think little by little it is becoming more inclusive and I'm super happy about that inclusivity more in who's being included in media and marketing, a little bit more inclusion and in sizing, and hopefully disabilities are being included little by little. So the discussion has started and I think that with time it will grow. And I think I think to address your question on what can kept people do now, I don't know if I address that exactly. Oh no, yeah, I think um, to have those resources, like like you said, um, is really important too. And so it's really great to see that there are um, options for people to customize existing fashion that is readily available to everyone, right? And being able to make it more accessible for them. Um, and like what you're doing, personalizing them. So that's really amazing to hear that there are um, emerging um, fashion um, outlets that are addressing this already. And I know that, um, you know, sustainable and um, green fashion is a huge thing. And I definitely mm -hmm. hope that accessible fashion for people of all able-bodiedness is um, going to grow just as much as that. And I think something really important to mention as well is for people who need accessible fashion, there is a also a webpage called Patty and Ricky that they kind of get put together all of the independent designers and bigger brands that are designing clothing that's much more inclusive. So for example, for people with um, with low dexterity or for people who are um, who need, for example, our wheelchair users. And so they have lots of products, both intimate wear, clothing and accessories for people with different needs. So I would point you in that direction if you want to find something that already exists now in the market. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for answering these questions and also having an amazing, insightful presentation. It was such a pleasure to have you with us. Um, so we're going to conclude this session, but thank you all for attending and we hope you learned a lot and enjoyed uh, Camila's presentation. Again, um, we can continue to this amazing discussion. I feel we can take hours of discussion, but um, unfortunately due to time, please join us on Slack again to um, continue um, talking about inclusive fashion. And with that, thank you so much and have a great rest of your night. Perfect, thank you so much for inviting me. Have a great night, everyone. Bye.